Hello, I'm back for part two and of our discussion about uh, Rhett and Link's uh, deconstruction. And if you didn't see part one, there'll be some of the stuff in this uh, video. A lot of it you would be able to follow, but it will make a lot more sense I if you've seen part one. We are going to jump <coughs> right in after I say a short prayer um, with where I left off. For me, it's only been about uh, 30, 40 minutes, I think, since um, I finished part one. But because it takes uh, a lot more time to edit these videos than it does to record them, uh, it's probably going to be a few days between when I post part one and uh, part two. So here we go. Uh, let's, let's, let's stop and uh, pray. Um, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with me as I share some thoughts uh, on some very important topics that a lot of people wrestle with and a lot of people care about. And I pray that you will be with everybody who's listening and that your Holy Spirit will be guiding their thoughts and their hearts and minds while they're listening and, and afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the topics that contributed to Rhett and Link's uh, deconstruction uh, is hell. And um, uh, specifically, uh, there are, um, here we go, hold on just a second, I'm getting my, uh, my notes set up here to, to, to work. Uh, there are many Christians and, and others, people who aren't Christians, uh, have been troubled by the apparent injustice and cruelty of eternal torment. Um, uh, this is what traditionally, uh, not all Christians, but uh, it's what most uh, Christians have believed uh, throughout history and uh, what most Christians around the world today. Uh, it's, the, it's the traditional view. In fact, uh, sometimes in discussions on the topic of hell, this is called the traditional view. And it says that those people who are not saved uh, at their death, um, the unrighteous, uh, that they will be resurrected and judged by God and they will be sentenced to an eternity of torment. So a billion years later, they will still be in torment. And a trillion years later, they will still be in torment. Now, different people have different ideals of what the torment is. Some people think it's a uh, literal fire and uh, agonizing, intense pain continually. Other people think it's more emotional uh, torment. But one thing that they would all agree on that these people do not have any joy ever. Uh, trillions of years is just the beginning. It keeps going forever. Uh, they don't have any peace. They are continually in some type of torment and uh, that this is a penalty um, that God uh, uh, judges and, and causes them to have to experience. Um, now, this, this uh, Christian doctrine of eternal torment is a common element in deconstruction stories. Uh, Rhett and Link both mentioned this as something that bothered them. And, uh, you know, when Rhett was talking, um, I really appreciated his tone and uh, kind of the way he presented things, even though I strongly disagree with his conclusions and the path that he went down. Um, but the one time that he seemed to get the most agitated and the most emotional, and I'm not saying he was wrong for doing so. I, I'm not saying it was an uh, inappropriate emotion. But, that, but what he seemed to get most emotional about is when he talked for a few minutes about this, this belief in eternal torment. And um, uh, many people have been bothered by this. And in fact, uh, many people who have left uh, historic Christian belief um, or today, uh, people who have left evangelical Christianity, uh, many have mentioned uh, the, the doctrine of eternal torment as being um, one of the main reasons that they left. Now, I, I'm a little bit suspicious if someone claims that like it's, it's the only reason. Uh, I, I doubt that that's true, but people mention it as, as one of the, the things that caused them to leave. So it's a common element in deconstruction stories. So, um, so Rhett and Link uh, thought about this problem and um, they were disturbed by the injustice of eternal torment for the unsaved. Uh, unsaved people may have done a lot of bad things, 
but they, nobody has caused any other being, including God, uh, eternal torment. Um, some people say, well, they sinned against a God with infinite value, but they didn't cause him to lose infinite value. They didn't cause him to lose infinite glory or honor. Uh, they didn't do an infinite amount of damage to him, but they are sentenced to eternal torment. And this seems very unfair to a lot of people, uh, and it seems very unfair to Rhett and Link. And so this, this doctrine contributes to their deconstruction. And um, it, they mention it late in their story, so it's not clear um, how big a factor this was. Some people mention this as one of the main factors for, their, for, for the reason that they became atheists or they became agnostics. And uh, I, I've written blog posts on this topic, and, um, and again, there'll be links to this, th to, to this material. Now, I also have thought a lot about the issue of hell. Uh, it's amazing how much Rhett and, I, Rhett and Link and I have in common. Um, they thought a lot about science and faith, and, and they thought about hell, and I've spent a lot of time on this particular theological doctrine. Um, and so um, I saw biblical evidence for something different. I saw biblical evidence for a doctrine called conditionalism, um, or, or you could say conditional immortality. It's also known as annihilationism. And um, so I do not believe, I used to believe the traditional view that the unsaved would be tormented forever, but I do not believe that's what the Bible teaches. And it's not at all because I've lost my evangelical faith. I, <laughs> whew, I am... Uh, true blue, uh, sold out for Jesus, sharing the gospel, want to see people saved, want to see people baptized, born again, getting free from sin, living for Jesus. The Bible is all true, guy. And uh, when I came to see this, this different view of hell taught in the Bible, it actually strengthened my overall evangelical belief system. It, it fits so much better. Remember our analogy of a wall? Um, imagine a rock that's in there, but it doesn't fit very well. So there's cracks between it and the other rocks. Uh, but, and, and that was like the traditional view of hell. But for me, when this was replaced with belief in conditional immortality or annihilationism, uh, boy, it fit so exactly and, and beautifully. I mean, just harmonious. And uh, so I want to talk about this a little bit because I think that if more Christians knew about this doctrine, uh, and, and understood and believed this view and taught it, that it would remove at least one of the big influences um, that caused people to deconstruct. Now, I'm not naive to think that if, if Christians all came to this view of conditional immortality, that nobody else would leave the faith. Uh, but I think it would, it would help a lot of people. And even for people who are Christians and, and, and who never leave the faith, I've uh, uh, communicated with a lot that have been really seriously, deeply disturbed by the doctrine of eternal torment. If the Bible really did teach it, I believe the Bible is all true, that would settle it, but I have become convinced that the Bible does not teach that doctrine. So I believe in this thing called conditional immortality. What is that? What it says is simply this, that um, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere from Genesis to Revelation, does it say that all people will live forever? A lot of Christians imagine that all people automatically have uh, a, a soul, and then and then we're going to be resurrected and, and have physical bodies, and they and and they just automatically imagine that everybody's going to live forever. Uh, but the Bible actually never says that. It only says that the righteous, uh, meaning those people made righteous through faith in Christ who have been forgiven and then uh, experienced transformation and sanctification, these are the only people who are given eternal life. And the Bible says this consistently and persistently uh, all the way through the Bible. And so conditional immortality says the people who are saved will live forever. The others will be raised to face judgment. And they will stand before God in their raised bodies, but their bodies will not be transformed to be ma made like the body of Christ. Uh, those who are saved, our bodies will be raised immortal, never to die again, incorruptible, never to get old and wear out and, uh, uh, again. Uh, but, the, but the unsaved will, will not be raised with immortal and incorruptible bodies. They will stand before God in judgment. Um, 
I believe that, that, that there will be, and, and then they will perish. Uh, uh, they will, they will uh, eventually be born to ashes, and something might be left over like ashes, smoke, dust, but there won't be any conscious living people left over. Now, the process of judgment and the process of perishing uh, may be, and I believe it probably will be, uh, uh, involve some type of torment. And again, uh, I, I feel like I don't know because I don't think it's clear enough in the Bible will that include physically inflicted pain? Um, will, will it be mostly mental torment and anguish? I, I'm really not sure. But I believe the amount uh, that they suffer in the process of being judged and in the process of perishing will be different depending on how much they sinned and uh, how much light they had from God, how much they knew of his will and they disobeyed anyways, those types of factors. Um, but then eventually they will be gone. And the only people who will continue to exist forever will be the righteous. And in eternity, uh, uh, there won't be uh, anybody in existence anywhere who isn't joyfully submitted to God and living in harmony with him forever because the unrighteous will have been bond up. Now, I want to share just a few verses where I see this, and I'm going to do this kind of quickly, and then I'm going to give some resources you can go to if you want a lot, a lot more resources and a lot of in-depth study on this. But um, one verse that teaches this, this doctrine is John 3.16, and um, whew, this is my second round of talking for a long time, so I made myself some tea. For God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now here Jesus lays out the two possible destinies for every human being. Those, only those who believe in Jesus will have eternal life. You can't, somebody who's, who, who's, who doesn't have eternal life, you can't torture a dead person. Go ahead and try. Uh, well, don't, that would be disgusting. Don't do that. But, uh, but, but you could, uh, if for some weird reason you really wanted to test this out, you could take a dead bug. And if you were sure that it was dead, please don't do this if you're not certain. Uh, you could do poke it and do all kind of things to it, and uh, it would not feel it. And if you made a terrible mistake and it wasn't dead, if, if, if it reacted in pain, you would immediately know, oh, it's still alive. Oops. <laughs> I, I pray, don't really do that. That's terrible, isn't it? But people believe that God is going to torment people forever. Uh, so maybe it's not such an inappropriate uh, illustration. Anyways, only the people who believe in Jesus will live forever. What will happen to the other people? It doesn't say that they will be tormented forever. It says they will perish. Now just think about this. Imagine two people who had relatives who went off to fight, let's say, someplace like um, Afghanistan. And let's say that one of them uh, tragically was blown up by an IED and, and just totally uh, instantly killed. Um, they would say my relative, maybe my uncle or my cousin, perished uh, in Afghanistan. But let's say that somebody else, uh, the military came to them, they said, we have some terrible news. Um, your, your uncle, uh, we, some of the troops that survived this attack saw that he was captured by uh, ISIS, and, um, and we have intelligence indicating that he's being held, and uh, you know they don't have to say it, but you would know that there was a chance that he was being tortured. Well, even if he was being held captive and tortured, you would never say, my uncle has perished. You would say, he's in a terrible situation, uh, go save him, go rescue him. And so this word perish is not a good fit for the doctrine of eternal torment. It is an excellent fit for the doctrine of conditional I immortality, which sometimes is also called annihilationism. Um, now, if you dig deeper and you look at the Greek word that's translated perish, you'll find that it's apollomi. And that word, even more, cl even more clearly than the English word perish, is a really great fit for the doctrine of annihilationism. Uh, because you might think, well, did Greeks ever talk about the possibility of people completely ceasing to exist, body and soul? And the answer is, yes, they did. Uh, Plato talked about it. Plutarch talked about it. Athenagoras talked about it. And you might say, well, what word did they use for that? One of the words they used over and over and over and over again 
was a polymer. And I've documented all this in some uh, material that I'm going to give links to. And so uh, John 3.16 is really strong support for the doctrine of conditional immortality. I'm going to more quickly look at a few other verses. Matthew 10.28, Jesus says, Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So God, it doesn't say that God's going to torment people in hell forever. He's going to destroy the whole person, the soul and the body uh, in hell. And um, that word destroy, it's the same word that's translated perish in John 3.16. It's Apollo me, and it's a great word. Uh, it, it doesn't fit eternal torment at all. It's, it's an excellent word if you want to be teaching um, conditional immortality or, or annihilationism. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is being tortured forever. No, that's not what the verse says. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, only those who are in Jesus through faith are going to live forever. The others are not immortal. They are not going to live forever. That's why we call the doctrine conditional immortality. You only live forever. You're only immortal if you have faith in Jesus. This is what the Bible teaches uh, uh, consistently. Uh, 2 Peter talks about what's going to happen to the people who are not saved. Uh, and if he, God, reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he reduced them to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming to the ungodly. This is, Peter's obviously not, not talking about what happens to, the, to your ungodly neighbor in this life. Have you seen your ungodly neighbors reduced to ashes? What, what he's talking about, and it's very clear when you look at the context of, of, of uh, Second Peter, he's talking about the final judgment. They're not going to be tortured forever. They're going to be torn to ashes. Uh, this is in the Old Testament as well. Uh, Genesis to Revelation, this doctrine is taught. In Genesis 3.22, after Adam and Eve have sinned, uh, the Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. Notice there was one terrible possibility. And God said, there's no way I'm going to let this happen. And the terrible possibility is fallen people living forever. So, so that fits with conditional immortality. He's only going to let people live forever if they can live forever in joy and unity and harmony with him, which we find out happens through Jesus Christ, through knowing Jesus Christ our Savior, hallelujah. Uh, now, there are verses that people think teach eternal torment, and this is one of them, Matthew 25, 46. And they will go away into eternal punishment, talking about the goats, the people who uh, their lives were not transformed as a result of knowing Jesus. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, <coughs> The, uh, the phrase eternal punishment, that, that could mean eternal torment because torturing someone forever would certainly be a type of eternal punishment. But I want to point out that that is not the only type of eternal punishment. If God uh, kills people, and not just their bodies, but their bodies and their soul, the whole person, um, if he destroys them in hell and they remain dead forever, then that is also a eternal punishment. It is an everlasting punishment for the simple reason that it lasts forever. It rules out the possibility that after uh, uh, destroying their body and souls in hell, God would recreate them again. That's, they're going to stay dead forever. But not only is annihilationism possible, according to Matthew 25, 46, <coughs> Matthew 25, 46 actually supports conditional immortality. And this is why it says the righteous into eternal life. Only those who are righteous, and the evidence of our righteousness is the types of lives we live, caring for the poor, visiting the sick, um, stuff like this. But, but we also know from the rest of the Bible that this is connected to our faith in Jesus. And, and, and the righteous are the only ones who are going to have eternal life. So what's the only type of punishment that lasts forever that doesn't involve living forever, that doesn't involve eternal life? The answer is annihilation. The answer is um, 
uh, that these people will be permanently destroyed and stay dead forever. Uh, now, if you want to um, see a, 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 a uh, ten minute and lightly animated uh, explainer video that I made on why I changed from believing in eternal torment to um, believing in um, annihilationism or conditional immortality. Uh, I, I'm going to give a link to this video, and um, and and you can watch it. Ten minutes is just a very very quick overview, as you'll see. And if you want to go into more depth, I have created a uh, a blog post that is a collection of resources, uh, other blog posts. Uh, that uh, videos I've made, that 10 minute video, and then also a two part sermon I preached on this topic, but then also videos, podcasts, uh, 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 a book, and a blog posts that other people have written. I, I have a lot of material collected on the topic of hell. There's three major views annihilationism, eternal torment, and universalism. And, um, and so, I, I, if you want to, to study this in a lot more, you can go there. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is probably the most difficult topic for this entire two-part series. Uh, what does this mean for Rhett and Link after they die? Rhett and Link, them, I, I don't know if I would have been brave to bring this up, but they themselves discuss it. Uh, each of them discuss it in their uh, deconstruction story. And um, uh, I remember both of them saying, you know, we're not really sure what comes after death. They're agnostic. They're not atheist. They're not, they're not saying we know that there's nothing after death. There's nothing but nature. They're saying we're, we're not sure. Uh, but one thing that both of them said, they said, we're pretty certain that God isn't going to torture us forever because we, we looked at this evidence and we had these doubts and we just honestly were honest with ourselves that we couldn't believe the, uh, our evangelical faith anymore. We're pretty sure God won't torture us forever for that. And, and, and I think they find some comfort in that. And in fact, Link, I think I remember, specifically says he finds that thought kind of comforting. Well, um, I actually agree that God isn't going to torture them forever. And I want to say I don't know what Rhett and Link's eternal destiny is going to be, but I will say in general that the Bible teaches us that if people die outside of Christ, and that would mean if they die without faith in Jesus as their Savior, that they will not be saved. And um, so I hope this isn't going to be how things turn out for Rhett and Link. Oh, there's nobody I want this to be true for. But unfortunately, the Bible indicates that a lot of people uh, will not accept Jesus. Um, and and, and um, so if, if, if uh, anybody dies not having faith in Jesus, what I believe is going to happen is they will be resurrected, they will face God for judgment, and um, they are going to know that they could have had eternal life, living forever without pain, without sickness, with perfect, pure joy, unmixed with worry, anxiety, fear, doubts, uh, with other people that they love and enjoy in a beautiful world, what God always intended. They could have had that but they're going to miss out on it. And then there may be, and I believe there will be, at the very, very least, that there will be significant mental anguish, weeping and gnashing of teeth at the judgment and in the process of perishing. And honestly, when I think about a, a situation, if, they, if it turns out that they're not saved, and I pray that they will be, if it turns out they're not, I, I would think that one of the most painful things, if I was in their shoes, would be on Judgment Day, if I was to see other people who I influenced also not to believe in Jesus, missing out on eternity with him forever, God have mercy. God have mercy. I pray that they will change course, and I pray that no one will follow them. <sighs> okay. Whew. I kind of didn't want to do that part, but I felt like it was important to, 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 because this is real. This is, I believe this is really, really true. And, uh, and, and, and the issue is not that God is saying you deserve to be tormented forever. The issue is God is saying, do you think your life 
was so good and so wonderful that you deserve to live forever in my perfect world. And, God, and, and anybody outside of Christ who hasn't been forgiven and hasn't had the process of transformation that's going to be complete uh, when we get new resurrection bodies for those who trust in Christ that have been changed into Christ's likeness, the answer is going to be no. I'm not going to let you live forever because you don't trust Jesus and you would ruin the new earth and the new heaven the same way you ruined the first one. So God is not being unfair. He's not being cruel. He's just saying you can't live forever. But there is a way to live forever through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we've already mentioned that some. It's a very uh, happy topic. It's a, a, a major foundation of the Christian faith. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a cornerstone of the Christian faith. Going back to the analogy of a wall built with different sized stones, the resurrection of, of Jesus would be a huge, giant stone, just like belief that God created everything, maybe even bigger. The, it, 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 the, the, the central event of human history is the death and resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. But why should we believe it? Um, you know, we don't see people get resurrected today and uh, so why should we believe this amazing claim that Jesus was resurrected? Well, I think there are good reasons, and I'm going to give some of the positive uh, reasons that I uh, uh, believe this is true. And I would summarize it by saying that we have m one of the big, huge reasons I believe it, not the only one, is multiple reliable eyewitnesses. So first of all, let me talk about multiple eyewitnesses. In the Bible, authors of the Bible... We have more than one who saw with their eyes Jesus risen from the dead. They heard him spoke. They saw that he was dead, buried, and then he rose from the dead. They saw him. They heard him. They touched him. They ate fish with him. Uh, so uh, Acts one three. After his suffering, talking about Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. This is written by Luke. Luke himself was not an eyewitness, but he says uh, that he sp spoke to people who were eyewitnesses. So Luke was like an investigative historian or an investigative reporter. He, talked to pe he knew people who were eyewitnesses, and he wrote his gospel based on interviewing them. And then John was an eyewitness, and this is what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And he is talking about the resurrected Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter also saw Jesus risen from the dead, and he wrote, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter saw it with his own eyes. And um, so these are multiple eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I also say they are re reliable. Why do I say that? <sighs> well, sometimes people make things up, and sometimes um, they lie, and, and they claim that they saw things that they didn't see. Um, because there were multiple eyewitnesses, and they saw Jesus repeatedly, and they ate fish with him, and they talked with him, and I don't think they could have just been mistaken. And it was multiple occasions and multiple people. That doesn't fit, fit in a hallucination at all. So they're, what they're claiming, if they're sincere, is extremely strong evidence. But are they reliable? Might they be lying? Well, when you look at why people lie about things, um, it's to gain some kind of an advantage. People might lie if they're going to get power, if they're going to get money, or they might lie to avoid getting in trouble. Or they might lie to get popularity or something like that. But when the apostles told the story of Jesus, um, the people who killed Jesus were still in power. And when they talked about the resurrection, they knew it was going to be very unpopular with the people who had power and influence. And their lives were going to be in danger. And in fact, uh, the, these eyewitnesses, they were put in jail for their testimony. They were beaten for their testimony. They were stoned for their testimony. And uh, most of the apostles were eventually put to death for their testimony. So they had nothing to gain from a worldly point of view. 
the types of things that motivate people to, to lie, and everything to lose, and yet they kept telling the truth. It makes sense if they really did see Jesus risen from the dead. Because if they really did see Jesus risen from the dead, they knew that this life was not the end of their story. And they knew that whatever they suffered, beatings, prison, even being killed, it would all be worth it. Because they believed, and they had good reason to believe, the promise of Jesus, that one day they too would rise from the dead. And if they had been faithful to him, their reward would be so, so much worth all that they suffered. Um, now, I want to talk about a... Uh, a few more stones. And what I mean is a few more of the reasons that I believe that the gospel story is true. Um, so here we go. I want to talk about, uh, so one of, the, one of the types of evidence that helps me to believe, and I'm just going to talk about these quickly, is little miracles I've experienced. So I have never seen firsthand a miracle as big as some of the ones in the Bible, like somebody lame from birth getting up and walking and dancing uh, because of a miraculous healing. But I have some, had some supernatural experiences that are best explained, by far they are best explained, by um, God being real, the Bible being true. Um, so I've, uh, uh, God uh, spoke uh, in our hearts, uh, in our minds, through leading us by his Holy Spirit to my wife and I while we were um, apart. I was in the Navy far away on a submarine, and, um, and we had never discussed the possibility of going into full-time ministry. We had never discussed going overseas to share the gospel with people. But while we were apart, God spoke to each of us independently about this. And when we got back together, we found out. Uh, he, he, he spoke specifically to my wife and said, you will follow your husband overseas and teach your children and others about Jesus. And that actually happened. We ended up uh, living, we were blessed to live in Indonesia for 14 years uh, got to know uh, wonderful people. We, 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 we really grew to love the Indonesian people, and I had uh, many opportunities to share with them the, the truth about Jesus and uh, the love of, of Jesus. And so I, I just don't believe that could be a coincidence that, that, that we got that same leading from God while we were apart. Um, and, and then um, uh, I've had a couple of dreams that were supernatural in nature, and... Um, uh, and, and in um, one case, I had a dream about something. The dream was symbolic, but uh, I woke up. It was very intense, and it's personal, and it involves other people, and um, I, I, I don't feel free to, to, to share the details of it in a public setting like this. But, um, uh, but I woke up in the middle of the night, like 2 or 3 in the morning, and, and it was so intense that I, I, I was wide awake and praying about it. And... And it was just like five or ten minutes after I woke up while I was praying about it, the phone rang. And I've never gotten a middle-of-the-night phone call from family like this before or after that I remember. And it was uh, uh, w one of my sisters calling to tell me about a situation which matched exactly what I dreamed about. And God used that dream to tell me that he knew what was coming and that he was going to help me through it. It was going to be very painful. It was very painful. Uh, in fact... Um, uh, I kind of went into a type of depression for several years uh, as a result. P and that wasn't the only factor that caused the, the, the time of depression, but it was one of the factors. And, um, and, and, and that dream helped me. And the timing of it, I just don't think there's any way it could be a coincidence. And plus it matched so well what actually came to be, even though it was kind of in symbolic uh, form. And, um, and then there was a time, this is going to sound real to some of you all, but uh, Hope and I were in a small group. This was in the States. And uh, there was a lady who seemed to, the way she was acting, it seemed like maybe she was being oppressed by some kind of demonic force. And we were all praying, like people did in the Bible, for the demon to be cast out. And, the de and this lady was a little frail. Uh, she was like a petite lady. And this deep, really monstrous sounding voice came out of her, and I don't even remember what the demon said. I, I don't really care. I mean, I don't, but Hope and I, my wife and I, we both totally agree that we felt that it was physically impossible for that lady to make that voice. Now, you weren't there, so you may not believe me, but I know what I heard. And it did seem like the demon was cast out and that the lady got better. Um, and there's been some other 
what I call little miracles. Uh, admittedly, not as big as the ones recorded in the Bible, but to me, clear evidence is of God's uh, supernatural, uh, supernatural confirmations that God is real. And then prophecy being fulfilled. So uh, some people focus on Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the New Testament, and there are good examples of that. What I'm thinking about is um, one example, and I'm just going to share, uh, well, it's, it's got two parts to it. Um, something happening that's been happening for the last 2,000 years that Jesus predicted. One part of it is Jesus said that Christians would be persecuted. And for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been persecuted. Now, if you are like me right now, living in the United States, we have uh, relative to Christians around the world today and throughout history, we have a relative small amount of um, violent uh, persecution. Uh, it, it, there have been cases, but it's, it's not, it doesn't happen on a widespread basis. But throughout history and around the world today, like where I lived in Indonesia, on the island we lived on, while we were there, at least hundreds of Christians were killed for being Christians. In our city, sometimes uh, radical Islamic groups uh, set up roadblocks looking for Christians. And this was a big city. On big roads, they would do this. And they would uh, destroy the vehicles of any they found. And in some cases, the Christians were severely beaten. And um, uh, that never happened to me, but it happened on roads that I traveled on. Uh, and, and, and around the world today, in North Korea, thousands of Christians uh, are believed to be, many thousands probably, are believed to be in concentration camps. Many have been murdered. Uh, there are, uh, Christians are persecuted and killed in places like Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and different parts of Africa and in China, there's persecution of Christians. So Jesus said this would happen, and it's happening. Now, and, and despite the fact that Christianity teaches love, it, it teaches that we should submit to government authorities, uh, and, 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 and it teaches us to even love our neighbors and to do good. Despite this, the, the Christian message has been opposed. Uh, but then Jesus also predicted something else that would happen at the same time. He said the gospel would spread to all nations. And this has happened. Today, there are Christians in every political nation in the world. Now, when Jesus said all nations, if you look at the Greek word, it was more than just political nations. It was ethnic people groups. So there may be some ethnic people groups within political nations um, that have their own language and their own culture that haven't been reached yet. But there's less and less of those, and the gospel has, has advanced a huge amount all around the world. And the fact that these two things have happened at the same time, that despite intense persecution and opposition, the gospel is spread around the world, to me that has to count as some evidence, and to me pretty significant evidence, that uh, the Bible is true. And then uh, a technical piece of evidence is uh, the massive amount of manuscript evidence we have um, indicating that uh, we can trust that the Bible we have is an accurate representation of what was originally written. Some people say, oh, there's all these little mistakes in the manuscripts, but none of those mistakes change any significant doctrine of Christianity. There's no ancient manuscript of the Bible that says Jesus stayed in the grave. There's no ancient manuscript of the Bible that says, oh, it's okay to commit adultery. There's no ancient manuscript of the Bible that says uh, the world just popped into being on its own. God had nothing to do with it. No, signif no significant Christian doctrine. The resurrection, uh, Jesus dying for sins, nothing is brought into question by the types of differences there are in these manuscripts. And there are thousands of them. There is far better manuscript evidence for the Bible than for any other ancient document, massively more. And so, and there's many other types of evidence to believe in Christianity and to trust that the Bible is true. I've just mentioned a few that are important to me. Now, at the beginning of part one, I mentioned that uh, my story and Rhett and Link's story have a lot of things in uh, common. We grew up as evangelical Christians, majored in engineering at North Carolina State. We were active in Christian ministry. We worked in uh, the field of engineering for a few years after college. We left engineering to pursue ministry. We were both very interested in the relationship between faith and science, but there are even more important differences. Their Christian faith grew weaker. It deconstructed over time due to evidence they saw, the way they interpreted it, the way they understood it, until they reached the point where 
by their own um, testimony, they explicitly say they are no longer Christians. My faith has grown stronger over time by God's grace, um, and, and, and it's, also, it's due to evidence I've seen, and I'm still a deeply committed and active evangelical uh, Christian. Now, there are some other differences between Rhett and Link and my, me. They have made huge amounts of money as entertainers. Now, when they first went into this, uh, uh, well, they made a lot of money, I think, in one month, and then things went bad, and for a while they had a tough time. But in the long run, they, they moved from North Carolina to uh, Los Angeles uh, to be in the entertainment industry. They, 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 um, they left the ministry they were in at Crew in order to do that, and they eventually made a lot of money. And, um, you know, we lived in Indonesia for 14 years, and compared to the average person living in the world today, uh, I'm rich. But by U.S. standards, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor of a small rural country church, and I'm very thankful for the size of our church. Um, uh, the church supports me as a full-time, uh, with a full-time salary. Uh, some churches our size ha have bivocational pastors, and um, uh, nothing wrong with that, but I'm thankful that I'm supported full-time. Uh, but, uh, you know, by U.S. standards, uh, we are... Um, I'm thankful that we keep our bills paid and we live a, a humble life, but it's, we're satisfied with, with, with what we have. And compared to most people around the world, we're wealthy. But compared to Rhett and Link, we would be dark poor. Uh, I said in part one, they made, I, it was a lot of money. I think it was something like 17 million last year, it, as reported in the news, if that report is accurate. Uh, uh, you might think, how can you do that on like YouTube videos? Well, it's not just YouTube videos. But when you have millions and millions of people watching your videos every week, you can make a lot of money from advertising and also by um, sponsors and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know in detail how they do it, but they do it. They also have a massive following and lots of influence. Uh, I make some YouTube videos, not nearly as many as they make. Um, and, uh, of course, I have a lot of other things I do as a pastor, so I don't have as much time for it. But, you know, if a video of mine does really well, uh, I have a couple of videos that have gotten more than a thousand views, but most of them don't get anywhere near that, and, and that's okay. Um, they have a massive fo following. I think one of their YouTube channels has something like 16 million followers, and um, uh, and they have different material out there. So they have, uh, from a human point of view, it appears to me that they have massively more influence uh, than 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 I have. Um, but that's okay. I want to say uh, this. I wouldn't change places with them for the whole world. I, I really would not. And um, I would rather influence a couple of hundred people or 20 or 30 or even just one in staying true to Jesus and following him and trusting him than uh, entertain um, millions of people uh, without any influence one way or the other, or worse, what they're doing now is influencing other people to to give up on their faith. And um, uh, what does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And they say that moving to Los Angeles and the s setting they were in there was not the main reason they deconstructed but I have to think at the very least that it may have played into it in terms of producing, being an environment and an atmosphere that made deconstruction easier and more likely. And there may have been subtle ways in which they were seduced by um, money and uh, popularity. And, and, and I don't know for sure that that's part of their story, um, but it certainly seems to be a possibility. So I've benefited from the study and work of many people who strive to conform and defend the gospel. And this is needed today. Um, the truth of the gospel is attacked in many ways from many directions. But it did not begin today. Uh, Paul wrote to the Philippians, Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you, because I have you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation 
of the gospel. And that's what I want to do with this video. I want to defend the gospel and conform the gospel for people who might be tempted to have the kind of doubts that uh, Rhett and Link have. And maybe I would be delighted if somebody heard this and was one to faith in, in, in Jesus. Um, and, and this is not something that just Paul does. He calls us to be, he called the Philippians to be in partnership with him doing it. And, 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 and God is working through us to do this, to help each other today. So I want to give some pastoral advice. Uh, stay close to Jesus through prayer, the board, the Bible, and fellowship. Um, uh, this will help your faith to stay strong. If you have questions, it's okay to have questions. Um, I hope that your church will be a safe place to ask these questions. Uh, I, I would be um, glad to have uh, members of my church who are struggling with the types of questions that Rhett and Link have to come and sit down and talk with me about them. And, if I, and, and sometimes they're really good answers. And, um, and if I didn't know the answers, I would certainly want to help them find answers. And I'm not claiming that there's a clear-cut answer for every possible question about every voice and issue, but there's certainly enough answers so that a person shouldn't have to lose their faith. And it seems to me that Rhett and Link went down some wrong paths and miss some of the answers. Uh, theistic evolution, instead of looking at the path of intelligent design, um, things like that. And then I want you to encourage you to help others. This is, this is a, a very important issue. It's eternal life or death issue. And one way you might help others, um, if you feel it's appropriate, uh, of course you can pray for them. You may be able to share your own story with them and give them reasons that you believe. Encourage them in their faith. Maybe sharing this video with them would help them. Or sharing some of the resources that I link to in this uh, video might help people. So I would encourage you to prayerfully consider are, are there people who um, are in a setting where they're exposed to these types of, of, of influences that have caused some people to deconstruct that might be helped by uh, watching this video or, or looking at some of the, the materials I, I, I link to. And uh, there's a lot of other great materials. I've just scratched the, uh, scratched the uh, surface here. Uh, so you are all partners, all of you who, who believe um, in Jesus, you are all partners in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Some of you may be uh, gifted to be able to teach others and explain to others some of these things. Others of you may be uh, showing the truth of the gospel through your humble service and loving giving. Um, uh, and, and like I said, one thing you can do is point people to resources like this video. And there's uh, lots of people have spoken on topics like this. Um, and, and, and so I, I hope that God will walk through you and me to help people to strengthen their faith instead of lose it. I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, people who are listening to this, if they are struggling with doubts, that um, they will be strengthened and encouraged. I pray that you will help them to find people and not to give up easily who will listen to their sincere doubts and questions and walk through those with them because you, you have answers that are deeply satisfying and that actually strengthen our faith. Uh, help us, Lord Jesus. Uh, Lord, if there's any way to bring Rhett and Link back to the faith, I pray that you will do that. Uh, but I also pray for all of those who have heard their testimony, that you will protect them so that they won't deconstruct, but that they will be driven to investigate these things and that their faith, faith in Jesus will be strengthened. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be with us and bless us. In your name we pray. Amen.